I'm a former police officer, it's time to share the most disturbing case I've handled. I'm going to share a few stories with you. One by one though, because if I was overwhelmed by them, I have a feeling you will be too. I'm Officer Bradley, I retired from the force 10 years ago at the ripe age of 50, I'll begin with a story from my 20 years as a police officer that stuck with me like a deep thorn. January 17, 2005, we got a call about a woman who had locked herself in her bathroom, she said her boyfriend was trying to kill her, my partner Mason and I arrived at a house on the end of a street, the lamp posts flickered yellow and the wind danced the trees and bushes, the clouds were thick and the air ice cold. We took position at the front door, we knocked. Police, open up. Only the sound of wind chimes. Mason kicked the door open with all the force he could muster, we scanned the house downstairs, no one in sight, clear. You hear that, I said, Mason looked up at the stairs. Gentle cries, a woman, so subtle, and as if muffled behind a door, in a room. Thought she was supposed to be downstairs, said Mason. We made our way upstairs, ma'am, it's okay, I began, you're safe now, no one's going to hurt you. The crying stopped abruptly as if someone hit pause, then it started again, but he's still here, replied the woman from inside the bedroom. My partner and I checked the entire house, no one's here ma'am, you're safe. Downstairs, the front door slammed shut, my partner and I gave each other a gaze and I could notice his brow sweating despite the cold night, I used my head to gesture for him to take a look, he stood from atop the stairs and looked down at the front door. Just the wind I think, he said. Then a gentle voice came from inside the bathroom. Are you sure, Officer Bradley, the woman asked. The entire night at that scene, neither my partner Mason nor I used our names out loud, not once. Ma'am, do you need help or not, Mason was agitated, we need to know you're okay, so step back because I'm kicking it in. A part of me believes Mason was more eager to see the woman's face, to find out who she was and how she knew what she did, than he was for her safety, he wanted peace of mind. No, hold on, hold on, I said, she might be sitting right by the door, we don't want to hurt her. Then she said it. Officer Bradley, tell Mason that if he touches this door, I will visit his family in the late hours of a certain night and break down a door of my own. The woman's voice was an octave deeper when she said that. I never understood the expression, why does a ghost, do people actually turn that pale in the face? I learned that they in fact did when I saw my partner react to those sinister words. I couldn't stop him from kicking in that bedroom door this time. But when he did, we found nobody inside, there wasn't a window above the shower through which to escape or another door to go through, and yet, we were certain that we just had a full conversation with a woman behind this door. We scanned the entire house, including the backyard, one last time, inch by inch, nothing. My partner and I communicated non-verbally the rest of the night, so when it was time to leave, we gave each other a look and left the house without even looking back. Now, this is the part of the story I haven't told anyone, not even Mason, we were sufficiently disturbed so I didn't want to tell him what I'm about to tell you. When we left the house, I drove us back to the station that night, he probably thought I didn't notice, but his hands were shaking too much to drive comfortably, he doesn't drink coffee. As I reversed the cruiser out the street, Mason didn't look back at the house. But the truth is, I did, and I sincerely wish that I hadn't. My eyes squinted through the thick darkness between me and a garbage can at the side of the house to see a black figure kneeling by the gate, as if watching us leave. And as we finally began to drive away, as the house became more and more distant in the rearview mirror, the figure slowly stood itself up, and, I'll swear even today, that as it stood up, its head peeked over the roof of that two-story house. What really scary horror story really happened in your life or to the people you know? I live in a small town in NZ. My big sister and me used to wait outside the back gates of our primary school for our mum to pick us up and walk us home after school. It was quieter at the back gates, and my mum has always been terrible with time management, so she was often late coming to get us. One day, a man in a van drove up and parked on the curb where we were standing and waiting. It was one of the days where our mum was late to get us, so there wasn't anybody around. He started telling slash asking us to get into his van, cajoling and joking and then getting irritated. My sister, who at the time must have been 7 to 8 years old, I would have been 5 years old, refused politely, saying she didn't know him and that we weren't supposed to speak to strangers. Luckily out mom came back in time and when he saw her coming he drove off. I have no memory of it at all, but it freaks me out all the same. My mom spent some of her childhood in Saudi Arabia. Her father worked as an engineer for an airline company and was making some good money, they moved to NZ after a few years in Saudi. My mom told me a few stories about how her and her dad would be walking in the markets together, when soldiers would come along and herd people up to attend beheadings in the local stadium. Her dad would always bundle her up into a store and hide around the back so they wouldn't be herded up with the local population. One day in the markets, she also told me that the soldiers detained a foreign woman whose hair had been showing from underneath her headscarf. They made her kneel in front of everybody and cut all her hair off roughly, making her scalp bleed. What is the most terrifying thing you've witnessed alone at night? Five years ago I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, 
walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommate that even the dealers in the city were polite. But all of that changed in just a few minutes one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky, and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still, until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back. And then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward. Smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments I felt relieved, until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked that I stood there for some time, staring at him. And then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated tiptoed steps as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone. Except he was moving very, very quickly. I just stood there, completely frozen as the smiling man crept toward me. And then he stopped again, about a car length away from me. Still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what the f do you want? In an angry, commanding tone. What came out was a whimper. Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger. He was coming back my way. And this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off of the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile. But he was never there. What is the scariest real story ever? The story I am about to tell you is 100% true as it happened to me. It's probably more spooky than scary. I'll let you be the judge. Many years ago, before there were cell phones we had these things called pagers strapped to our hips. Someone would page you with their phone number and you would call them back when you got to a phone. As an on-call audio-visual technician, my pager would go off all the freaking time. Like most people who used pagers, our clients knew that if you followed up your number with a 911, that would indicate to the technician to stop what they were doing and call right away. Although I was always busy I rarely if ever got 911s. One afternoon, while I was traveling from Orlando to St. Petersburg, my pager goes off with a number I don't recognize, followed by a 911. I immediately found the first exit, pulled into a little truck stop looking outside of Plant City, and went to use the payphone. This takes maybe three minutes tops. I walk in, ask for some change and head to the wall where there are four payphones to choose from. I quickly pop my quarter in and dial the number displayed on my trusty pager. It rings, and rings, and rings, and rings. At this point, I'm a bit worried. Who would page me with a 911 and not answer their phone? It's just about then that I notice another ringing sound in addition to the one in my ear. Weird. I pull the phone from my ear and two phones over on the wall. Another pay phone is ringing, but with an incoming call. I hang up the phone I'm holding and the ringing stops on the other phone. I walk a few paces over, pick up the other phone, and look at the phone number printed above the buttons. I look at the number on my pager, I look at the number on the phone again. Except for the 911, they are identical. I kinda lose my breath for a second and then I make my way over to the girl at the counter and ask if she saw anyone use the payphone. She said I was the only person in the store in the last hour. The whole episode probably took 15 minutes, but man, I was freaked out. The hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up and I just wanted out of there. 
I got back in my car and went about 10 miles down the highway and came upon a scene that looked like a bomb went off. Four car pile up involving a tractor trailer hauling a load of steel that had come loose. State troopers and paramedics were just arriving. I have no idea why I got that page or from whom or what, but I'm convinced that if I hadn't, I would not be alive to write this today. If this ever happens, don't answer the door, hide, lock everything and never look into their eyes. I know that this sounds like the kind of advice to anyone left alone in the house at night but this is different. It started a week ago, I was in bed it had just turned 1 o'clock, I was scrolling on my phone while my wife Steph was asleep. I suddenly had a notification pop up at the top of my phone. Anyone with a video doorbell will be accustomed to this. Motion detected. I normally ignore it as it was either a car coming down the road or a person stumbling back home after a night out. Then the doorbell chimed, the notification followed, there is a person at your front door. I opened the app. There sure enough was a young woman standing, clinging onto my door frame. I answered, Hello, can I help you? She came back immediately. Please let me in, someone is chasing me. I told her to stay where she was and I would call the police. I heard her again. Please let me in. He's going to hurt me, please hurry. At this point my wife woke up, she asked me what I was doing. As I put some clothes on ready to go downstairs, I said there was a woman at our door begging to come in as someone was chasing her. I was about to dial for the police when Steph opened the app. She said, Babe, no one is there. We looked back on the motion history, both notifications were logged. I opened the first one, nothing but our front porch. I proceeded to the other notification, where someone had pressed the doorbell. There was my front porch, shrouded in darkness but this time we could hear only my voice. Of course there was no response to my questions. I thought to myself, was I going crazy? My wife said it was late, I must have been half asleep and my mind was playing tricks on me. Even if that was right, it still didn't explain why we got the notifications. The next night we both sat binging a Netflix show in our living room. We must have lost track of time as it was nearly 1 in the morning. I went to check the back door was locked when my phone buzzed. I asked Steph whether she had the same. She had. I opened the app just as it notified me that someone had pressed the bell. We both quickly opened the live view, stood at our door, a child. The young boy must have been no older than 8, the camera was in night vision which was black and white. The boy's face glowed, eyes piercing through my screen. I once again answered, hello, can I help? The kid looked up at the camera, hi, my daddy broke down just up the road and his phone is dead. Can you please let me in, I need to use your phone. Me and Steph looked at each other, she shook her head at me. I replied to him, I can call someone out for you or maybe the police can help. The boy then seemed to turn. His voice now had anger to it. Open the door I need help, are you really going to let me stay out here all alone? His story had changed, I went back after swallowing my own fear. Stay there I will get help. This time I called the police, they came around 20 minutes later. By this point no one was around, we had seen the boy walk off around the corner 5 minutes after I had got off the phone. The officers checked our road and the surrounding area. They found no people, not even the odd car driving around. We both tried to show them the app but obviously, there was nothing there. The two officers were understanding and seemed to believe us. They gave us the department's direct number and told us to call them if anything happens again. We went to bed that night scared and confused, we didn't understand what or why this was happening to us. The next day we decided to get an early night. We made sure everything was locked and the house secure. We both fell asleep early, I was woken up at just gone 1 o'clock to the sound of two sets of buzzing from my phone. I ignored these, I just rolled over and went back to sleep. When I looked at my phone in the morning I opened up the doorbell app. The video playback showed nothing, but I could hear scratching for about 2 to 3 seconds after the apparent press of the bell. I went downstairs and checked the door. Three sets of four deep scratches went down my front door. The anxiety hit me like a tidal wave going throughout my body. I now fear the night ahead of us. Two nights ago we both had decided to stay up, we were going to put an end to this. We were on edge in our own home and it just wasn't right. The minutes drew closer to that damned time 1 o'clock. Then right on schedule, the notifications started. I opened the app, now stood there, one of the policemen. He was one of the officers that was with us the other night. I thought it was strange, it caught me off guard. Steph said that she will look out the window upstairs. We had both said earlier that one of us would look out the window to confirm if someone really was there. I answered the door, hello officer. Can I help you? He looked into the camera. We have an update on the problem you have been having. Can you please open the door? I felt a sense of confliction come over me. This didn't feel right. I had watched enough police programs and dramas to know they usually have to report to places with another officer. The lack of any police cars also unnerved me. Sorry officer. I'm sure you can understand the reluctancy to open the door due to our situation. He snapped back. It's fine. I am an officer of the law and instructing you to please open up. I need to come in and update you. Now I knew something was wrong. His whole demeanor was now completely different to when we spoke two nights ago. I watched as his head looked upwards. I heard my wife scream the words. Oh my god. His eyes. What the fuck. I rushed up the stairs my feet slipping as I ran, 
I saw Steph but she looked petrified. She stared at me blankly and said, you need to let him in, he will help us. I uttered back struggling to catch my breath. We can't, you know we can't. What did you see? What was wrong with his eyes? She tilted her head at me her eyes began to roll upwards. Let him in. Let. Him. In. Her tone started to change, it was turning into a gravelly rasping voice. Her face now full of anger as she screamed at me. Let him in now. I grabbed her and shook her while shouting, Steph, listen to me, snap out of it. She looked back at me dazed and confused. She said wearily, with tears in her eyes, I want to go to bed, I said, only if you are okay. She said she was fine and didn't know what happened. I checked the video feed once more, no one was there. It took me a few hours to fall asleep worrying about what happened to Steph. When I woke the next morning Steph was gone, her phone and jewelry left on the bedside cabinet. I went downstairs and searched for her but nothing, she wasn't in the house. I called the police department on the number I was given, I spoke to the partner of the policeman that was at my door. I told him everything that happened and that my wife had gone missing. They told me the officer that was stood at my door 8 hours earlier was on leave. He flew out on holiday yesterday morning, it couldn't have been him. In the hours ahead a search team was assembled and I joined them in searching the local area. There was no sign of her. It's now 11 pm, I'm sitting alone in my living room, my head now full of fear and radiating pain. I just want my step home, I just want normality back. Here it comes 12.59. 3, 2, 1 o'clock, the notifications came through, I opened the app. Steph was at the front door, I was almost half expecting it. I said, where were you honey? She looked into the camera. I was taken, but I escaped and I'm here now. Let me in and I will tell you all about it. I took a deep sigh. Okay, I will be there in a minute babe. What can I do? She is my wife. I have nothing without her. I wrote all of this throughout this evening, hoping for some sort of closure. Maybe even a happy ending to this horrible experience. I guess now it will just be a piece of evidence on what happened to us both. I need to go answer the door now. My wife is home. The police found the world's most horrifying thing under my house. 26. That's how many bodies they found in the pit below my house. It was an earthquake that brought them to light. If not for that, I'm not sure I would have ever known they were down there. When the ground shifted, a putrid smell seeped up from below and permeated the entire house. Trying to locate the source, I shined my flashlight through the access hatch for the crawl space. That's when I saw an arm. A human arm, poking up through the dirt. Immediately, I called the police, and that's when my life turned into a circus. Nothing like this had ever happened in our small town before and the media had a field day. Investigators started to identify some of the bodies. Local news outlets dubbed them the alphabet murders. Strangely, they appeared to have met their ends in alphabetical order. One per year, spanning back 26 years. All women in their late teens and early 20s. Amanda Zeller was the last victim, Karen Abbott the first. Of course, my wife and I were the primary suspects. We'd been arrested and swabbed for DNA to test against forensic evidence they found under the house when the very first bodies were being unearthed. However, I knew they wouldn't find a trace of me or my wife down there. Neither of us had ever ventured below the house before. Though, I was sure they'd find a connection for me to who I knew to be the real killers. My parents. I had only inherited the house from my evil, abusive, pricks for parents a few months prior. This was after they'd lost control of their vehicle and driven off a cliff. Good riddance, was my first thought when I was informed of their deaths. I'd never been more than a punching bag for the both of them. Something to scream at, smack, and berate at home, then parade out in front of the neighbors as some perfect little child. Yeah, some perfect little family we had. It was all BS. They were a nightmare, so I ran away when I was 15 and never spoke with them again. Shockingly though, they left me the house. I figured maybe it was a final screw you to me when I saw the state of disrepair they left it in. At least it paid off, but it was going to need a lot of work if I was going to sell it for a good price. That's the only reason why I moved back in. And now I realize they weren't just assholes. They were sick, sadistic demons. Both of their DNA was all over Amanda Zeller. They'd done it all together. The most shocking part was though, that when they tested my DNA against my parents, it showed I wasn't a familial match. I wasn't their son. We were baffled, until they found an older grave, separate from the pit, that contained a young couple whose DNA did match mine. Their first victims. What's the scariest story you know that is 100% true? This is an incident that happened to me about 10 years ago. I live in Melbourne, Australia. I was driving home from work one night around 9 p.m. midweek so the roads were quiet. As I was driving downhill I heard a sound that was like a jet engine roaring behind me. The next thing I know a car goes flying past me going twice the speed limit. It looked like a fairly old crappy car. The car started to get the speed wobbles and then one of the tires came flying off and rolled at speeds downhill whilst the car spun out and crashed. I stopped my car to make sure whoever inside was okay. A guy got out of the car and looked over at me then started moving extremely quickly towards me. I don't know why but I hit my internal locks on the car which was fortunate because no more than two seconds later the guy started grabbing at the driver's side door and smashing on my windscreen with his fists trying to get in. He'll never forget the crazy look he had in his eyes. I put my foot down on the accelerator and drove off back home. I decided to swap cars once I got home and drove back to see what was going on. I saw two fire trucks and about four police close to where the incident happened. 
When I got back to the crash site the guy was no longer there so I decided to head home. The next day at work I was online bored reading the news when I saw an article that shocked me. The article was about a guy who had been in a police chase for one hour and the police stopped chasing him because it was becoming too dangerous. Turns out the guy was high on meth, had stolen a car an hour's drive away and had been in a hot pursuit since. After crashing the car the guy apparently crossed to the other side of the road and hailed the first car that appeared which was a taxi. He got into the taxi and stole it. In the process he pushed the driver out of the driver's side door and the driver got stuck and dragged at speeds. The driver died from the incident. I called the police and had a detective assigned to me. He fingerprint checked my car and got a statement. I had to testify in the Supreme Court as a key witness in a murder trial. The guy got 30 years and they told me that my testimony was one of the main factors in convicting him. I often think back to that night and wonder if I hadn't locked my doors would I have been the one who got murdered. Detectives, what case made you consider resigning? In all my years working as a detective, I've never worked on a more disturbing case. It all started when Connolly and I were called in to investigate an attack on a beach volleyball tournament. On the city's largest beach, there was a national tournament with over 300 teams playing on 50 courts over the course of the weekend. The ages were from 12 to 65 and were both men and women. During morning warm-ups before the first game on the first day, one scream turned into two screams turned into 100 screams. Over one-third of the players needed immediate medical attention. Their feet, ankles, knees, thighs, hips, stomachs, and in some cases up to their shoulders and face, were covered in deep, gushing cuts. Someone had gone to the beach the night before the tournament and brought hundreds of small, flat pieces of wood with razor blades sticking up from the centers in an upside-down capital T-shape. The wood was dug into the sand, with the blade's sharp ends pointed upward, and hidden just under the surface so no one could see them. It must have taken hours to set up. There were no deaths, but the damage that was caused resulted in hundreds of injuries and several dozen athletic, young adults with sliced Achilles tendons and a dwindling future in sports. As with every investigation, we started off at the crime scene and worked our way outwards in tight, concentric circles. While the CSIs were combing the beach, Connolly and I were interviewing the people who ran the tournament, looking for any enemies or people who might want to target them in this tournament in particular. But those led nowhere. Sadly, the CSIs fared no better. The entire crime scene was a wash. There were so many footprints and shoe and sandal prints in the sand it was impossible to search for tracks. And the actual razor blades and pieces of wood had been doused in bleach before being placed in their small dugouts. There were no security cameras on the beach and the lone one that was in the parking lot didn't capture any cars between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. Our phones were ringing off the hook with tips but there were no real leads. After a month, we were nowhere in the investigation. But the case didn't end there. Not long after, at a senior home along the city's waterfront, a fire had started in the basement. Because of the accelerants used, it quickly overtook the first two floors. From there, the rest of the eight-story building went up. Twenty-two residents and nine staff died in the fire, all from smoke inhalation. We scoured the undamaged security footage but again found no suspects around the parking lots or front entrances. The footage from the rear of the building was destroyed, so we couldn't check it. Not even a week later, there was a mass poisoning in a junior high school cafeteria. There were 23 deaths, 15 of which were students, and over 100 severe injuries. Crimes like this don't just regularly happen. Somebody was trying to make a point. Our investigation showed that someone had stealthily broken into the school overnight and poisoned every piece of food in the cafeteria stockroom, fridge and freezer with arsenic. It was a miracle more people didn't die. All the school's exterior cameras were working, and after scouring them for clues, we finally found one at the back doors. The footage captured someone dressed in all black, with a hood and ski mask over his face. He'd used a small set of lock picking tools to enter the back door which led to the kitchen. He used the same door to exit and ran off across the soccer field towards the water. And suddenly everything clicked. An array of cases, all leading us to the exact same conclusion. The beach volleyball courts, the seniors' home, and now this junior high. They all backed out onto the water. We marked all three locations on a map and scanned down the coast for all the marinas and harbors. Then we went back through all the routes and picked out various waterfront hotspots we knew would have footage of their exteriors. Using the dates of the three incidents, we cross-checked the footage to try to find any repeat boats on the nights in question. We watched a lot of footage. There was only one boat that stood out. A large, older black speedboat was being driven by a lone individual we couldn't make out the details of. A red light glowed from inside the cabin. Connolly and I got pictures of the boat printed and went back to check the marinas and harbors. None of the docks we went to had seen the particular boat or had records of it. Which made us think it was docking in a private residence. I spoke to one of my friends in narcotics named Waco and he brought up the substance boats that had been populating the cove near the last dock we visited. It turned out that the many substance users in our city had been moving away from alleyways and SROs and onto small dinghies and substance boats, turning them into floating pill houses. The boats were harder for cops to break up or investigate, and you could float in the cove or out in the nearby channel for up to six months before having to vacate. Of course, the six-month rule was never enforced, so the cove kept getting busier with more and more substance boats. Waco offered to help. He went in one night and made his way around the 30 or so boats, which were loosely tied together. Waco found our black boat. He learned the owner was a guy people called Red. He was a dealer and let people use and pass out aboard his boat afterwards. The next night, Waco went back, and we followed from a distance with the Coast Guard. We had Waco wired so we could hear everything on board. His plan was to get on with a few others to buy and use some substance, then pass out. He would fake the shooting up part, and pretend to fall asleep. 
Connolly and I listened in, hearing the details of the casual conversations going on with the other users as they bought, and started prep. Soon enough, all the voices went quiet, including Waco's. A rough, agitated voice called out, asking if anyone was awake. There was no response. The voice, belonging to Red, laughed and said good. We heard some shuffling, then the engine on the boat revved into gear. The boat peeled out, leaving the cove behind. Waco had a GPS tracker in his shoe, so Connolly and I watched the boat on a monitor as it headed out to sea. We followed from a distance, the Coast Guard's lights all turned off and went completely stealth. Connolly and I continued listening in. After several minutes, the engine died down. There were sounds of chains rustling, then clanking together. Waco's voice came over the mic in a hushed and frantic whisper. He's chaining us together. There's an anvil on one end. Our captain flipped the lights and sirens on and the boat gunned it towards the blip on our radar. Over the mic, we heard Red notice the sirens. He started to panic and, from what Waco told us, was about to toss the anvil over the side. But Waco was now up and ready to fight. He pulled the same chain that was attached to the anvil, hitting Red from behind and knocking him to his knees. A fight on the boat ensued, and Waco put him in a chokehold. The boat arrived just as Waco managed to subdue Red. When we jumped on the boat, we found them panting heavily, grappling on the deck, the anvil perilously close to the edge. As we handcuffed Red and helped Waco up, I couldn't help but stare at the monster we had caught. This was the man who had caused such monstrous atrocities. But there was something unnerving about him, his face was oddly familiar. And then it hit me. Red was one of our own. A forensic specialist from our department. His real name was Robert. The same man who'd combed the beach, the same man who'd analyzed the burned down senior home, the same man who'd gone over the school's security footage. He was the insider, helping us solve the crimes he himself. Committed, leading us on a wild goose chase while staying safely under the radar. I was answered by silence, as he continued to look out into the horizon while Connolly put the handcuffs on. But as we started to take him into custody, a maniacal grin stretched across his face. Suddenly, Red lunged forward, knocking Waco into Connolly and me, sending us sprawling. With a swift movement, he threw himself over the edge of the boat, the chained anvil following him into the dark depths below. The sea swallowed him, the man who was a friend, a colleague, and a ruthless killer, before we could even react. And just like that, he was gone. But the most unnerving part? When we later brought our search team, his body was nowhere to be found on the ocean floor.